Welcome to CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives, the only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening, and now, enjoy the show. I'm E.G. Marshall. So many stories I've passed along to you. So many stories of so many kinds. But again and again, I come back to what we began with. The Gothic tale. What is Gothic? There are a hundred definitions. One of the ones I like best is a style noted by a gloomy setting. Grotesque or violent events and an atmosphere of degeneration and decay. Does this narrative fit the bill? I leave you to judge that for yourselves. Why are there no mirrors anywhere, Mrs. Kemper? If you want a mirror, I'm sure it can be arranged, Miss Falkirk, so long as you keep it in your room. (laughs) I didn't plan to carry it about. I wouldn't. It's the one thing Mr. Royston won't stand for. Why? I don't ask. And if you're wise, neither will you. Our mystery drama, Reflected Terror, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Up along the Hudson River, perched on the edge of tumbling escarpments to the river below, are great mansions built at the turn of the 19th century. A magnificence and splendor only possible today for the shahs of the oil countries. Royston Manor House was such a showplace, but by now, in 1896, It has long been in disrepair. Its master, Joseph Conning Royston, a sad recluse, victim of a consuming depression since the death of his beloved wife, in mourning for her untimely death, he occupies this desolate mansion, maintained by a skeleton staff. And to it, as our story begins, comes young Emily Falker. You're sure you're expected at Royston House, miss? Of course. Why do you ask? Oh, it's just there ain't many visitors these days. Hey, up that tea. Not like the old days. The old days? Mm, before the madam died. Used to be coachman there myself. My, it was something. Balls, garden parties, all them fancy folk from New York swarming up here all the time. <laughs> But no one comes anymore. Well, that big old mansion might as well be a tomb, ma'am. Nobody there but Mr. Royston, his poor old mother, the foreigners, the clempers, the dogs, and maybe the madam's ghost. Ghost? Mm, maybe that's what drove Master James away. Master James? Oh, that'd be Mr. Royston's son. Fine young fella, Master James. Been gone near five years by now. Gone? He left after his father came back. Never hit it off too well, them two didn't. <laughs> I must be boring you with all this small talk. No, you're not. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm going there to take up a, a position. Oh, well, that'd be to replace little old Mrs. Benson, the uh, nurse for Mrs. Royston's mother. I believe that's who it would be. I think that's the name Mr. Royston mentioned in his letter. He uh, did mention her name, did he? Oh, yes. Why? Why do you ask? Oh, well, uh, no reason at all. No, no reason. Uh, this is the beginning of the estate, the uh, part that lies outside the walls. It's getting so dark, I can't see. Is that the house? Way up on the hill? Let it be the gatehouse, ma'am. Nobody lives up there anymore except those damn dogs. 
What dogs? Oh, guard dogs, they are. Fierce as wild animals. <laughs> what to guard, I don't know. Otto's the only one who can get near him. That would be Otto Klemper. Him. And what is he, a, a gardener? Once was. Still is, I reckon, though not much is kept up. Oh, damn dog smell is coming. They sound so fierce. They are. Not, not the best of company. Hmm. Maybe that's why Mrs. Benson left. Uh, she didn't leave, miss. She, uh, she died. How? She tumbled off the cliff up there, down to the river. And was drowned. And she wasn't that lucky. Lots of rock down there. What a terrible accident. If it was. What do you mean? I saw her face when we brought her to the corners. And she looked like she was running from something. A, a devil, maybe. A, a those hounds out of hell. in the habit of writing everything down that happened in my uneventful life in a diary. So through it, we can follow the fearful and melancholy record of the history of Royston House. It began, as you have heard, and continued with my actual arrival in that great, gray, fieldstone monstrosity, with its terraces and balconies hanging in space over the terrifying drop to the bosom of the Hudson and the jagged rocks that line its shore far below. Well, here we are, miss. Uh, uh, l- let me help you down. Oh, thank you. I can manage. Well, right you are. Uh, I'll get your baggage off and into the house. Oh, hello, Mrs. Clamper. Arthur, you can put Miss Falkirk's bags in the servant's hall. I think you know the way. Well, as long as the dogs ain't around. Otto has put them away. Miss Falkirk? Yes. I'm Mrs. Temper, Mr. Royston's housekeeper. How do you do? And Mr. Royston has asked me to excuse him for not meeting you directly or sending someone, but he has given me orders that he would like to meet you as soon as you arrived. Shall we go in the house? Oh, I should like to go to my room for a moment and freshen up. Are my bags... There is no need to print. You look perfectly serviceable. And your bags will be taken care of. But I'm a mess after the train ride and the carriage. Please, I just... step in. Well, yes, but just let me straighten my hat or fix my hair a little. We I... don't stand on much ceremony at Royston House, Miss Falker. But please, Mrs. Tremble, just let me glance in a hall mirror. Where? There isn't one. You'll find few mirrors here. Why? Mr. Royston doesn't like them. That would be good reason enough for you, Miss Falkirk. <laughs> Who is it? Mrs. Temper, sir. Miss Falkirk has arrived. Oh, come in, by all means. Miss Falkirk? Yes? I hope you'll forgive me not meeting you at the train. Some affairs delayed me. Oh, I found my way all right. So I see. Well, you may leave us now, Mrs. Temper. Don't you want me to take her to meet your mother and get uh, settled in? Now, that can wait for a moment. I'll take her to meet my mother myself. Very well, sir. You know this. Uh, uh, sit, sit down, Miss Falker, please. Thank you. May I offer you a glass of sherry? No, thank you. I don't drink. That's very wise of you. I told you in my letters I was not looking for any fly-by-night flippity jippet of a girl afraid of being isolated. I don't think I'm a flippity jippet And as to being afraid of being isolated, I agreed to come here for a year's trial. If it gets... Too lonely, I won't complain. I'll stick by my bargain. Splendid. I applaud you, my dear. But it's not going to be easy. You didn't give me the impression that your mother was so difficult. Mother? Why should I? Well, I'm sure you'll find her quite tractable. And considering her age, not a hard invalid to manage at all. As a matter of fact, why don't we go and meet her right now? Oh, I'd like that. All right, then, come along. She's just over in the next wing. Now, why is that? Why did she leave the gaslight on in the hall? I have a lamp. Come, turn it off for me. Yes, sir, but why would we need it to see? I told you I have a kerosene lamp. Now, do as I say. Yes, sir. That's better. 
can't abide light ever since. And I can't abide it. Here, we go down this corridor. Do you have bad eyes, sir? What? You said you couldn't abide light. Oh, did I? Well, I'm sure I have my reasons, which I don't intend to give you. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pry. Well, don't. Ever. In this house. Ignorance is bliss. This is Mother's door here. It's Joseph, Mother. Can you spare us a moment? Oh, yeah. It's a bother. But I suppose so. Only just a moment. Can you understand? I don't know what I was expecting. Certainly not what I saw. From the sound of her voice, Mrs. Royston had seemed a cultivated, civilized woman. But that was not what opened the door. She looked like I don't know, the White Queen in Alice through the Looking Glass, perhaps. Her wasted face, which must have been quite handsome, was pale as paper, and her hair was a mad bird's nest of wisps and snaggles. She looked like a corpse, save for her eyes, a bright and startling blue, which shone even in the shadowed light like chips of aquamarine. Eyes that were empty behind the sparkle. The eyes of a mad woman. Polly, he let you out, did he? He let you out? Mother, this isn't Polly. It's Miss Emily Falkirk who's come to take care of you. I might have known it was a trick. She looks like Polly. Do you try to look like her? I don't know who Polly is. She was my wife. What? You know, Mother, Polly has been dead for a long time. And Mrs. Benson, a short time. Oh, where is she? Is she dead? Mrs. Benson had to leave us, Mother. That's why we engaged Miss Falkirk. To guard me? To help you. Nobody wants to help me, Joseph. You know that. I am a voice. Crying in the wilderness. Mother, please. Who will listen? No one will listen. Come away, Miss Falkirk. There's nothing any of us can do when she's like this. But I'd like to help her. You can't help her. You can take over that duty just as soon as you're settled yourself. He led me out of the room and down another long corridor. The only light was that oil lamp he carried. Suddenly, we were in a sort of a gallery, peopled with heavily framed oil paintings. Before one of them, he stopped, lifting the lamp. For the moment, he seemed to have forgotten that I was with him. I can bear to look at you in a painting, but not in the flesh. Not in the flesh. That was my wife, my beloved wife, Miss Falkirk. You see how much you resemble her. I? Oh, oh well, no, not really. She, you. And so are you. I thought when all the mirrors were gone, the reflection was banished forever. Now you come to bring it alive again. <laughs> What's disturbing the dogs? I don't know. Mrs. Clemper, what's happening? With the dogs? I don't know. Otto has everything under control. So don't worry. Very well. You may show Miss Falkirk to her room, then. You mean I can stay? We'll see how it works out. Is, is something wrong? He thinks I look like his wife. Uh, I mean, the one who was his wife. Do you? Much, too much. It's a pity you came. Better you leave the first moment you can. But I need the job. How can I? You'll have to decide that for yourself. It may not take long. Well, there are all the elements. The old and decaying house, 
marked by a feeling of degeneration. A gloomy enough setting, wouldn't you say? And as for grotesque and violent events, well, our story has scarcely begun. Wouldn't you imagine that they are lurking off stage in the wings, ready to burst forth? But the proof of that must wait until I return shortly with Act Two. The days passed at Royston House, and Emily Falkirk settled into a routine. Her room was pleasant and cheerful enough, although it looked away from the river. Her days were spent with the now silent Mrs. Royston, bathing her, dressing her, reading to her, taking her to sun on the balcony over the Hudson. She shared her meals with her, served by an incommunicative Mrs. Clumper. Mr. Royston kept to himself, and Mr. Clumper seemed forever to be out of doors, roaming the property with his snarling dog. Royston! Well, what are you doing out here, Pauline, when the dogs are loose? Oh, I just couldn't stand being cooped up any longer. I was the breath of air. Oh, well, we're all cooped up here, no? Perhaps we can be better acquainted. Oh, I'd like to be with someone. It's very lonely here. Well, then come. I'll walk you to the gazebo. There's a splendid view of the river. It's hidden away from the house. A moment. Tristan, it's on. Ah, oh. See, most in here. Drive it. They will stay. <laughs> we can be quite alone. Come. Why do you have them? Terrible dogs. They are not terrible. They're very gentle. If they know you. Oh, I can't believe that. But I'll show you. Tristan, it's on. Come see here. Uh, Give me your hand. Oh, I'm not sure. I... I'm... They must have your scent. Uh, don't be afraid. So, right. Ah, uh, I'm fine. It's where I get them. No, you're obliged. <laughs> Will you go? Yes. Oh, they still make me very nervous. Uh, no need. They will never touch you again unless I say so, or anyone else with you. I would not have them harm you in any case. Thank you. I appreciate that. You will have a chance to show that in a moment. What do you mean? Once we are alone. Mr. Clemper. Oh, no. You don't think I... that I... Let me go. Your wife... Would... What she does not know will not hurt her. No, you can't do that to her, not to your wife. That cold iceberg. Oh. <laughs> when I saw you arrive... I knew you are what I knew. Oh, what was that? Uh, the dogs. There must be a stranger on the property. Or they would have stayed when I ordered. Why is everyone so afraid of you at Royston? If you mind your own business, you will never have to know. And you and I will complete ours at a more favorable time. Ah, I seem to have flushed the game. I'll go and find out. Hurried back to the house. I wondered who the intruder on the grounds might be. But I didn't meet anyone in the house. And after checking my patient to see that she was still napping, on my way back to my own room, I stopped again before the portrait of Mrs. Royston. You do look like her. <gasps> oh, Mrs. Clamber, I didn't know you were there. More than one doesn't know how careful I come and go. Oh, you startled me. You say I... Look like her. Well, is that a good likeness? Fair. It favored her quite a bit. She looks so young. She was a good deal older when she died. How did she die? She was in Africa with the master on a trip around the world. And she caught dengue fever, I think they call it. Oh, how awful. When was this? Five years ago. And he was terribly in love with her, wasn't he? Oh. His whole life was wrapped up in her. More is the pity. He was blind to anything else. <sighs> but we haven't time for chatter. Why aren't you with your patient? Mrs. Royston is having her nap. You should be with her. Why? What are you afraid that she might do? I didn't say I was afraid she would do anything. But you are, somehow. Everyone is afraid in this house. Everyone is a sort of prisoner, aren't they? Why? Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. The dogs, the walls, the secrecy. 
And why are there no mirrors anywhere? I want one. I want one in my room so I can arrange my hair and make my toilet. Oh, if you want a mirror, I'm sure it can be arranged. So long as you keep it in your room. <laughs> I didn't plan to carry it about with me. I wouldn't. It's the one thing Mr. Royston won't stand for. Why? That's his business and his right. I don't inquire. And if you are wise, neither will you. Yes? Ah, come in, Miss Falkirk. Close the door. You sent for me, Mr. Royston. Yes. Are you going to discharge me? What? I said, do you want me to leave? Whatever gave you that idea? The day I came, you said... Oh, I mean, I just thought that's why you sent for me. Oh, forgive me. I was somewhat abstracted. I uh, made a trip to town yesterday, a rare excursion. I bought something for reasons of my own. I no longer want it. It's wrapped in that package on the table. You may have it if you want. What is it, Mr. Royston? Something Mrs. Kemper tells me you asked for. A mirror. You may have it on one condition. What is that? You must keep it in your own room. It is never to leave it. If you wish. You may leave now. Oh, uh, one other thing. Yes? Two or three times the dogs have been disturbed lately. Prowlers of some kind. It wouldn't be anyone looking for you. Me? I told you in my letters I'm alone. I have nobody else in the world. No family? No friends? My family is dead. My friends are half a continent away. No young man in your life? That is why I am half a continent away from my friends and him. He married someone else. <laughs> Oh, we all have our crosses to bear. Very well, Miss Falkirk. That'll be all. I left this brooding, haunted man in a turmoil, clutching the heavily wrapped package he'd given me, which turned out to be an inexpensive, quite ugly, but serviceable hand mirror. It was a godsend to be able to see myself again and fix my tangled hair. Suddenly I felt stifled. Where are you going? Oh, just to get a breath of air, Mrs. Clamper. The dogs are loose, and my husband is not back from town yet. The dogs are used to me now. I wouldn't count on it. I'll stay on the porch. Mrs. Clamper. What? Why must we have them? The dogs, I mean. What is it that Mr. Royston's so afraid of? Who said he was afraid of anything? But he must be afraid of something or someone. Why did he hide behind a wall and close gates and have those vicious dogs? The dogs are not vicious, except to strangers. They are my husband's children. And you ask too many questions. Go out if you must, but don't be late to dinner. I walked out to the porch. But it was a heavy night with little air stirring. And suddenly the oppressive heaviness of the house was smothering me, making it hard to breathe. I fled out into the quiet, dark night. I had a wild desire to scream, but my throat was so choked it was all I could do to breathe. I could feel a reasonless panic welling up inside me. And then all of a sudden, it was reasonless no more. The dog started to bark frantically, and I could hear someone running. But before I could get out of his way, I... Uh, oh, I... I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, dog. What are you doing here? Who are you? Uh, not much time for socializing. I'm, I'm James Royston. Uh, who are you? Am I so Are you Mr. Royston's son? Yeah, on and off. When he wants to recognize me. Oh. What am I going to do about those damn dogs? They don't know you? We've never met formally. Uh... Oh, you'd better get behind me. Oh, uh, can you control them? Oh, let's soon find out. Where's Ken? He's so dumb. Oh, I never figured you for an animal trainer. I'm not. What do I do now? Well, get him to buzz off. I don't know how to do that. They, uh, can't you tell them? But they only understand German. Oh, look, if, if you let them smell your hand, maybe I could tell them that you're a friend. <laughs> not on a bet. I, I get the notion they don't like me any better than I like them. I, I, I could tell them to stay. Yeah, while we took off. Solid idea. Why don't you? It's in German. Oh, 
I don't remember the word. Uh, uh, well, I can help. Uh, see, Blyben is the infinitive uh, for a command. Let's see. Uh, uh, how about Blyb? That's what he said. Doctor, Blyb here. Stand this. Blyb here. Oh, lady, you are a lifesaver. Well, if you want to save yours, you better get out. After finally getting in again, not on a bet. There must be some easier way of getting to see your father. Well, who wants to see him? Last person I want to see. Then who do you want to see? My mother. But she's dead. And buried? Buried, yes, perhaps. But not dead. Not decently dead. Now, there's a statement to conjure with. Buried, but not decently dead. Who is this strange intruder that Emily has saved from the savage guard dogs? Is his name really James Royston? And is he actually her employer's son? I shall return shortly with Act Three. In the gathering dusk, Emily Falkirk has the strange feeling that time has been brought to a standstill while she searches the face of this handsome, red-haired young man who has dropped so unexpectedly into her life. And in spite of all sensible alarm signals ringing in her head, her heart tells her, paradoxically, to trust him, no matter how odd his statements. But time can be held still only so long. What do you mean, not decently dead? I've searched half the world, and I've yet to find my mother's grave. Mr. Royston, if that's who you are, I, I don't think I'm the one you need to talk to. This is something between your father and yourself. Wrong. He's doing everything he can to keep me out. Why? Because of what I might find out. You, you want to hear about it? I... No, I... I... Even if I did, <laughs> the dog... We simply can't expect him to stay quiet like this indefinitely. Not while we're right here on top of them. Yeah, uh, there's a gazebo right down at the end of this path of pine. I know, that's where I was headed. Well, will you come with me there and let me explain? I don't know why I went with him. <laughs> I write that now after the fact, as if I didn't know then just as well. I went with him... Because ridiculous, impossible, childish as it may seem, from the first moment I looked into James' wide spaced eyes, from the second he first smiled, his crooked grin, from the minute marked off by the time that I first felt him near me, I was in love. He was my man, and I was his woman. And most of all, I sensed he needed love and me so desperately. Now in the gazebo, I was finding out why. What do you mean? He's not really your father. Well, you have to understand about my mother. Uh, he met her in France nearly 30 years ago. He wanted to marry her, but his parents wouldn't hear of it. My grandfather threatened to cut him out of his will. But then the old man died, and my father went back to France. Lived there for three years, married mother, and... After I was born, brought her home. They were very much in love. She was so beautiful. And looked so much like you. <gasps> I'm glad you think so. Your father does, too. Mm. My father. He isn't, you know. Isn't your father? No. You see, that was the whole trouble between us. Only I never knew it until my 21st birthday or just before it. But who was your father? Somebody in France. Someone my mother had turned to when when the man I always thought was my father walked out on her that first time. But if she was married already, how... She wasn't married. She had me, and the guy had abandoned her. And that's why she became Mrs. Royston and came back with him to America for my sake. But I thought you said they were in love. He was. I always thought my mother was. Till... Till? Well... It all came to a head because there was some kind of inheritance I was supposed to have, and I told him to his face I didn't want any part of it. 
I was ordered out of the house. I must say I took advantage of that and ran back to college. I never thought that would be the last time I'd see my mother again. I thought she died in Africa. So did I. You see, right after the big quarrel, they went on this trip around the world from which she never came back. That is, if she went. I don't know what you mean. I wish I was sure that I did myself. After my mother died, my father refused to see me. If she had a will, I heard nothing about it. I was out of college by then, and I didn't give a damn. I shipped out to go around the world myself. And you're just back from that? That's about it. Been back most of the year, but my fa- Mr. Royston refuses to see me. And I haven't been able to get in the house. Even some detectives I hired couldn't. That's when I decided to make a try myself. You know, there's more than one old tree around the property I knew I could climb in by. But didn't you know about the dogs? Mm, you have to take some chances in life. But why did you want to come back here, knowing that you weren't wanted? Because I have every reason to believe that my mother didn't just die. I think she was murdered. But even if that were true, how could you prove it? Listen to me, Emily. When I was in Africa, I went to Dar el Salaam where my mother was supposed to have died. There was no grave, no record. No one knew about her death. In every port I called on, I, I checked steamship records of the boats she was supposed to have traveled on with my father. No record. Only on the transatlantic liner that left America did I find a listing of Mr. and Mrs. Royston. You think... You don't mean that somehow he might have... Oh, that, that she might have fallen overboard? No, I don't think that at all. Then what? I... I don't think my mother ever left this house. I think she was dead before that trip even began. Oh, you can't believe that. How? I think he killed her. Oh, that's sick. That's ridiculous. What could he have done with... I mean, what... What did he do with her body? That's what I want to find out. I think he buried her somewhere inside the house. Oh, how can we even imagine such a thing? It isn't imagination. This is a letter I received from Buddy shortly after her death. Who? Oh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mrs. Benson. Mrs. Benson? The lady who had my job before me? Yeah, and she had another one before that. She was my nurse and later housekeeper for many years till my mother died. Now, let me read you just a few lines. Uh, let's see, uh, here. So many dark, secret things since the bright years when you were growing up, Jimbo. And now this awful justification of all my buried suspicions since my dear Polly died... It, you see, my mother's name was Paulette. By sheer accident, I was able to get into her old rooms. And how they've changed. Why? My dearest boy, I shudder to say this, but I am afraid, deathly afraid, that it is because she never left them. You must come home and see for yourself. I cannot, dare not say any more till then. By the time I received this letter, Bonte was dead. James, what is it you want from me? I want you to help me get into that house so I can see for myself. But if that's the part of the house that's locked now, up... Look, I have a key. My mother gave it to me. Oh, I don't know. I have no right to. And besides, the dog... Now is the perfect time while the dogs are quiet. But how do I know I can trust you? I mean, a stranger. You don't. Except I don't believe you and I feel strangers to each other. Not anymore. No. No. But if we are to move, it must be... Oh, it's too late. Why? That must be Mr. Clamper coming back. The dogs are welcoming him. Well, if all I suspect is true, he'd be the last person to welcome me. Well, if I can't get inside, there's only one other chance. But will you take this key, Emily? To get into your mother's apartment? Yes. What would I look for? Well, there was more in the letter than I read. In my mother's bedroom, there was a great double door with mirrors leading to a small dressing room. The door was on the wall opposite the windows. Now, let me know if it's still there. Uh, here. You can write me or, or, or send a message at this address. Oh, I don't know. Please. I... Please, promise. Somehow, I, I, I know I can count on you. Then, then we're fated to, to meet. Again. And again. Oh, it's you. What 
What are you doing out of the house? I, I just wanted to get a little breath of air before dinner. It's forbidden to wander the grounds without permission. So, this time we forget it. Go alone? Of course. Who else would be here? For your sake, better no one. Come, it's time for dinner. It is midnight now, and the house is quiet. It is not far to the end of the hall, and the door long closed to Mrs. Royston's rooms. But it is not so much of a surprise to find the key turns easily, and the door opens without effort. Inside, the dust lies everywhere, except for a worn path through it to the wall opposite the windows. I hold my lantern high, but I see no mirrored wall opposite the door, only a heavy tapestry hanging from the molding. I put my lamp down. I try to draw it open. Nervously, I jerk at it, and something rips, and the whole tapestry comes tumbling to the floor, stirring up a cloud of dust which chokes me. But my cop is arrested in terror. As I see staring at me from inside the wall, a misty figure all in decaying white, the skin drawn over the skeleton so tight and paper thin that the bones seem to shine through, a ghastly grimace of agony on her face, a face that the lantern in her hand shows in the glimmering light as a horrible travesty of mine. <laughs> Now you see her too, Miss Falkirk. We're both doomed. He's standing behind me in the room, a lamp in his hand. The reverse image of the horror in the wall. And I turn back to see... Oh, God, forgive me. That the wall is a mirror. And what I am looking at is... Must be. Has to be a reflection... The lamp, the room, all the finite things are in that dusty, shadowed reflection. The same. Only the figure that holds the lamp is different. Mr. Royston, instead of his long dead wife. Oh, now you know my secret. What secret? Why, I cannot abide a mirror. Because it shows me no reflection of myself. Only my wife. Why? How? I murdered her, you see. And buried her in that wall. Because she could have ruined me financially. How? It's where all the money came from when I married her. From the man who could not give her child a name. But you don't know about that. Yes, I do. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters except the secret must be kept. We must all die to do that. It's the only way. But how did you keep it? Why was everyone convinced you'd gone on a trip around the world? It wasn't too difficult at that time. The clippers could be bought off. My mother I used shamelessly. She pretended to be my wife when we left on the trip... It was winter. She was disguised in heavy furs. It was easy enough for her to go as far as the boat and then slip away. I didn't realize the weight of guilt I would thrust on her to make her mad enough to need you as a companion. Uh, what happened now? You are just as curious as Mrs. Benson was. Only it took you a shorter amount of time. I couldn't leave her alive to tell. How can I, you? No, please. No. It's no use screaming. The wind carries your voice across the river. Not much further. We're almost to the end. I won't go there. I won't let you throw me over. You go if I have to drag you there. There is no help. Come on. You've delayed enough. The dog. I'm shot. Call him up. 
clever. Call him off. <laughs> Christian! He's on! Arthur! Come in here! Serves you! It's all right, Emily. It's all right. You're safe. Oh, how did you get me? Well, after meeting you, you didn't think I was ever going to leave, did you? I hid out in the pool by the fountain where the dogs couldn't scent me, then I waited till I could waylay Clever. All I meant to do was to make him lock up the dogs, but while we were taking him up to the gatehouse, we saw you and Royston come up on the cliff. Oh. I made him set the dogs on him. But what happened to him? Did the dogs... No. No, in trying to shoot them, he shot himself. How? The dogs are trained to take a weapon away. One of them had him by the wrist, and accidentally, uh... Is he dead? I hope so. Oh, Jane, how could you... Well, because if he isn't... For what he tried to do to you, I might have killed him with my bare hands. He was dead. And there is only one footnote to the story. The idea of a man who could never see his own reflection, only that of the woman he murdered, haunted me. When Mr. Royston was laid out, I took the mirror from my room... And I sneaked into the one where he lay. And holding the mirror before him, the only reflection in it was his waxen face in the sleep of death. And I hoped, beyond the curtain, that his wife's restless soul has found its own peace at last. Whatever reunion took place between Joseph Royston and his wife, a kinder union came to James and Emily. Within a year, they were married and lived happily ever after. So what better words to wind up this tale than those of Sir Philip Sidney about sleep, the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge, between the high and the low. I'll be back shortly. A gloomy setting, grotesque and violent events, and an atmosphere of degeneration and decay. In the beginning, I promised you all of these, and I hope I have kept my promise. For these are the ingredients of what is known as the Gothic Tale. Our cast included Marion Seldes, Russell Horton, Court Benson, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you've enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel. You can also visit my other YouTube channel by searching Mr. Brian McCarthy in the YouTube search bar. Until then,